majority rapport with Sam Cena. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cena. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The majority rapport. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It's Thursday, May 14th, 2020. I'm Michael Brooks on a Michael Thursday. This is the five time award winning majority report. Broadcasting many places and many different kinds of steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA, on to today's program. Jim Shore, correspondent for The Nation, is going to be talking with us about the success of South Korea's center left government and responding to the pandemic and also how they've used the success to expand on a broader policy set, including a Green New Deal and pushing forward with plans for peace on the Korean Peninsula. Another 3 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits. Senate has voted to allow the FBI to look at your web browsing history without a warrant. Trump's plan to limit the pandemic's death toll undercount the numbers. It's a brilliant plan. Wisconsin Supreme Court votes four to three to help increase those casualties. They've struck down the stay at home order. Republicans released the names of Obama era officials in an unmasking that revealed Flynn. U.S. immunologists suggest that if we don't get and don't continue with uh, shelter in place, that this virus could rebound in the winter and could be a very, very bleak time. Kentucky EMT worker was killed in a no-knock police raid. The target was already in custody. FBI seizes Senator Burr's phones and DOJ investigation into his highly questionable stock sales. And the COVID-19 test used by the Trump White House may miss nearly half of positive cases, according to the to an NYU study. Well, Hope Springs Eternal. Cyril Ramaphosa, South Africa's president along with other leaders, including heads of state of Pakistan and Senegal, said that if there is a corona vaccine, it must be free and universally available. Hunger soars. Trump administration resumes efforts to gut food stamps. McConnell pines for Pompeo as Kansas chaos looms. And... At first, renewable energy is poised to eclipse coal in the United States. South Dakota governor threatens to sue the Sioux over their attempts to guard their communities from the coronavirus. All that and much, much more on today's Majority Report. Brendan, Matt, how are you guys doing? Uh, I am doing all right. Uh, your video, however, is not the greatest. I don't know if mine is also bad. Brendan, can you weigh in on this? Um, uh, yes, are- I am talking to our Zoom tech god, and he seems to think that uh, it is a Zoom issue. So, but uh, is my video issue. is my video fine? And Michael's choppy right now. Uh, Michael's looks better now. Oh, Michael's does look better. Michael, can you mm. count down just to see how it looks when you're talking? 
10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. What should we do? I don't know what, I think we might just have to keep going like this. Uh, the audio seems fine. It's a Zoom issue. Um, oh, so sorry, I, guys. It's a Zoom issue. Yeah. Apologies. I mean, one, one thing we could do is if you want to uh, try to log off and connect back on real quick, that might improve. Sure, it. you want me to just leave? Leave the meeting yeah. and come right back. Yeah, I'll okay. I'll control the show for the time being. Um, All right, go for it. Talk. As a matter of fact, have a great show. I'm gonna go take a nap. <laughs> All, right, bye. All right, see you. All right, hello everyone. Uh, sorry about this. There's something we're go we're broadcasting straight from the cloud these days, and uh, so we don't really have a great insight into what goes wrong when it goes wrong. But the idea is it should be more reliable than relying on my internet. Um, I think it just requires a reboot. I don't know. I think I might be still choppy, but it's less important that I be clear than Michael. So we're going to try Here's Michael back. Let's see if this improves the quality. And if not, I uh, might have a, choppy, a little bit of choppy video today. Uh, Michael's connecting. Don't have uh, access to Sam's do, 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 do soundboard. Here he is. There you are. How's this, guys? Is it any better? I don't know if it's any better. We might just have to roll with it. Might just have to roll with it? Yep. All right. Well, apologies. I don't think... I think it's fine on this end. Um, yeah, I think... Of the it looks fine on mine, too. So it's just uh, nothing we can, I guess... Nothing focus. we can do, folks. It's very unfair because we had worked very hard. Um, but, but there's the Zoom problem. Uh, everybody knows about Obamagate, biggest story in the country, some boring back and forth about who author, I mean, honestly, Donald Trump is grasping at straws here and the polls do not look good. And here he is freaking out again. They're just still going for this. Well, I don't know what this does outside of not even their base as a whole. I mean, a large chunk of their base certainly doesn't do anybody anything for anybody that might be persuadable, but it does something for us. Easy content. Let's go. It was the greatest political crime in the history of our country. If I were a Democrat instead of a Republican, uh, I think everybody would have been in jail a long time ago. And I'm talking with 50 year sentences. Uh, it is a disgrace what's happened. This is the greatest political uh, scam hoax in the history of our country. Well, it is the biggest and people should be going to jail seen. for this stuff. And hopefully a lot of people are going to have to pay. No other president should have to go through. And I'll tell you, General Flynn and others are heroes, heroes, because what's happened to them, they weren't after General Flynn. They wanted him to lie about me, make up a story. And with few exceptions, nobody did that. There were many people. I watched KT McFarlane <laughs> the other day. I watched where she was knock, knock, <laughs> FBI, you know, the FBI. Okay. <laughs> This was all Obama. This was all <laughs> Biden. These people were corrupt. The whole thing was corrupt. And we caught them. We caught them. You and what I you saw, saw just now, I watched Biden yesterday. He could barely speak. He was on Good Morning America, right? And he said he didn't know anything about it. And now it just gets released right after he said that. It gets released that he was one of the unmaskers, meaning he knew everything about it. So he lied to your friend George Stephanopoulos. I like, I like that, the soreness. The funny thing about Trump being so aware of Biden's decline is that if he loses, he's going to like feel like he has no excuse. Like, how did it's going to be even guy? funnier. Yeah. It's going to be even funnier if Trump loses to somebody who everybody can see is in some form of mental decline. That's actually very funny. So, look, I mean, I obviously Russiagate as a political strategy was not an effective one. And I'll leave it in those terms. But um, you can recognize that the, the myriad problems in that process 
primarily in terms of kind of outsourcing politics to intelligence. Um, that That is innately problematic in my view. But if your base point is a genuine concern about surveillance, civil liberties, and potential authoritarianism, wherever it comes from, I mean, basically, in addition to this being, you know, a comical conspiracy theory, it's talking about putting political opponents in jail uh, for what seems to be, at the end of the day, a long, elaborate way of saying, we're picking up this chatter. Um, Maybe we're really hyping this chatter. At any rate, we're going to ask the president uh, if he can sign off on this process, which is basically his job. And again, we talked about this yesterday. I don't, I don't see why anybody would want a sort of unlimited, unsanctioned DOJ action to go after a presidential candidate or observe a national security advisor in transition. That seems to me that that would be a much more, that would be a scandal. Um, maybe if you had the Obama administration pushing for an addition to NSA surveillance and the Patriot Act and everything else, uh, allowing the FBI to look at people's uh, browser histories without a warrant. Uh, that might be something that would be concerning to people. So at any rate, um, it's the biggest hoax, biggest, worst thing ever. And, and George Stephanopoulos is your friend. It feels so lazy, too. I mean, it does feel very pandemic. lazy. As, as a, our friend of the show, David Roth, put it on Twitter this morning, he said... This is akin to like him swallowing Drano, calling nine one one to complain about the New York Jets, right? Or something. Uh, it's very boring. It's very very boring, uh, folks. Today's show is brought to you in part by Skillshare. Majority Report is made possible in part by Skillshare, and the first five hundred people who go to skl.sh/majorityreport8. That's number eight are going to get a free premium membership to Skillshare for two entire months. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers thousands of classes on almost any topic you can imagine. And all classes are taught by experts in their field. They have classes on drawing, painting, photography, video editing, web design, running a small business, and a whole lot more. Almost all of the classes are less than an hour and even and every class is split up into bite sized lessons. So it's easy to fit Skillshare into your week even if you have a busy schedule. Everyone can benefit from setting aside a little time to get creative. Everybody knows I'm always looking for uh, different ways and I am, I'm taking those bite sized language lessons um, and it is great that you feel like little, you know, even if you're really busy, the 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, that could just as easily be wasted, all of a sudden get turned into something constructive. And you can do that very easily with Skillshare. Any um, Skillshare has classes for every skill level, where you want to get better at something you already have a lot of experience with, or you want to explore something that's totally new to you. A membership to Skillshare is less than 10 bucks a month gives you access to their entire library of classes. But first, but the first 500 people who go to skl.sh slash majority report eight are going to get a free membership for two whole months. And we've put a link underneath the video. If you're watching on YouTube folks uh, on the Michael Brooks show on Tuesday, uh, we had a really deep conversation with Adolph Reed Jr. I check it out tonight. We're going to be streaming a conversation about China at around six o'clock with Vijay Prashad of the Tricontinental Institute. And we'll talk more about that um, before we go to the fun half. But now, are we going to take a brief break, guys? Or how, how are we doing this? We'll just let Tim on right now. Okay, cool. We'll let Tim, uh, Tim Shorik on. And... Uh... Give him a moment to connect here. Has the video uh, doing any better? Uh, it's a little bit better. It's better when there's two screens up. Um, it requires less download from either of us. So we'll do, I'm just, that's why I'm uh, gracing the screen with my nice. friends. Nice. All right. More today. Let's see. No problem. Uh, Tim. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. 
Tim uh, Shorak joins us, correspondent for The Nation. Um, Tim, uh, do you want to do video or uh, just uh, just audio? Video is good. Okay, yeah. So pop on the video, brother. Uh, what do I do? Oh, I, I, I just click here. You just click there. Start video. There okay. you go. There you go. Just the camera. Okay. There you go. Hey, Tim Shorak, here he is, correspondent for The Nation. Tim. How are you doing? Thanks for doing this. I'm very well, thank you. So Tim, uh, Korea has been uh, globally recognized, South Korea, for its success uh, in dealing with the coronavirus. And, um, you know, it seems to me you can't disconnect, you cannot disconnect that success from the fact that they have a really robust universal healthcare system. And you also can't disconnect that success uh, from the fact that they have especially in a time where, you know, governments across the world are, are uh, let's say, disappointing. They have a very dynamic uh, progressive government right now. So can you talk about what the Korean health system actually looks like and uh, who's in office right now and how that's related to their success in dealing with the virus? Okay. Well, let's start with the fact that you know, you have a government that cares for its people. That's that's the critical point. It's a nice thing. Uh, Moon Jae-in, the president now, who was elected in 2017, you know, was a longtime progressive. Uh, he was very active in the democratic bo- movement uh, during the 70s and 80s. He was arrested a couple times. He was a human rights lawyer under the authoritarian governments, and uh, you know, he's he 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 was elected in 2017 on. on in the wave, in the the aftermath of what they call the candlelight revolution in South Korea, people may remember in 2014, there was this terrible incident where this uh, ferry loaded with high school students, you know, capsized and and sank in, 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 in about an hour and a half and the government completely failed in in trying to rescue anybody. And it was a, it was a catastrophe just an utter catastrophe. And uh, people in South Korea were just shamed and horrified at at their government's inaction and and the way the government mishandled this this terrible event. And that was one of the issues that that led people into the streets to protest the presidency of Park Geun-hye, whose father was was the former dictator of South Korea. And you know, millions of people literally poured into the streets uh, in, in 2016, 2017 to, to force uh, what they wanted was the impeachment of their president. And he, she was impeached and uh, she was uh, thrown out of office and actually was tried and convicted on, on, on charges of corruption. But the point is that, you know, Moon came to power after that it was elected you know, by a very wide margin. And, you know, people really wanted a government uh, that would care for the people instead of, you know, ignore their needs and in and, 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 and the arrogant way that they had. And so that was a very big commitment of Moon Jae-in. And then on top of that, of course, you have this, this healthcare system, this national healthcare system, which has been in place for quite a long time. It was actually, uh, uh, you know, even during the authoritarian period, uh, it, that's where its roots are, uh, and and after the democratization is is when it was fully um, you know put into place. You know my only my experiences with it is you know personally I've I've you know gone to a hospital in, in South Korea, and I've been treated by doctors and I've been you know amazed by you know one the very quick treatment you get and and and, and how it's how you're how you're handled and also that you know you you pay almost nothing you know, for, for, for your, for your healthcare. And so, it, you know, it's a national system and it's, you know, it's very well run. And, and so, you know, that's, that's really the key to understanding it. And, and I would say, you know, a second part is that, you know, in, in, in South Korea and, and Vietnam and other Asian countries as well, the idea is that, you know, you, you, you do what you can to help your society. And it's not individual first, it's, it's the, you know, the society and the group. And so, you know, just a simple thing like wearing masks, right? Uh, you know, when I grew up in, in Japan and Korea, I was, you know, really, you'd always see people in the, in the, in the streets uh, that had colds that had masks on. And the idea was 
to protect other people. You know, you right. wear a mask so when you sneeze, you don't infect other people and give other people colds. And especially in a society, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, that's in cities that are very dense, Tokyo, Seoul, you know, that, that, that's, that's really critical, right? To, to not spreading, you know, any kind of disease. And, you know, people are, you know, used to that kind of thing. But the idea is you wear the mask not to protect yourself from others, but to protect others from you. And yeah. I think that's a fundamental kind of thinking that's true in Asia that's, that's not so true. Well, you can see it in America. It's all me, me, me. Yeah, so you don't have guys in South Korea with, uh, you know, Punisher uh, bandanas uh, going to uh, fast food spots with machine guns uh, demanding <laughs> that they don't have to wear a mask. Uh, yeah. So what about, um, talk more about his agenda in general, I guess, start domestically. Cause again, you've, you've really pointed out that this is an impressive leader, both in terms of his history, but he's got an agenda on labor. He's got an agenda on ecology, uh, and, and obviously also an attempt to build some, some actual stable, you know, peace in the Korean peninsula, but start domestic first. Well, when he was elected, the big issue then, and still a very big issue, is un- unemployment among youth, and 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 the, you know the fact that many people are underemployed. You know, there's there's a lot of this this kind of work where you don't work. You know, employers you know uh, hire you not full time, and so you don't you know you may work you know 25, 30 hours a week. You don't have health benefits and that kind of thing. Many many workers in South Korea you know, work under those kind of conditions. And it's, and it's, and it's really a, uh, a serious, serious issue and has been for quite some time. And so that was, that was one of the, you know, first issues, you know, he, he, he ran on actually, and, and, you know, was talking about when he ran, I was actually in living in Gwangju, South Korea, when Moon Jae-in was running for president and he came down there uh, three times uh, on his campaigns. And, and, you know, one of the big, you know, the first issues he would talk about would be jobs and, and creating a better economy, especially for, for all these young people, and, and trying to better the conditions for workers in these, in these kinds of uh, part-time jobs that don't have benefits. And one of his first actions as president after he was elected was, you know, he, he went to visit the uh, airport in Incheon, uh, where there's, you know, government run, and there's a lot of these, these, uh, these kind of workers were there, and he, and he, and he you know, that was his action was to show that he was concerned about it. And they've, they've taken steps to alleviate that kind of, that kind of un, unemployment and underemployment, but it's, you know, it's very tough right now, especially, you know, with, 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 with what coronavirus has done to the uh, economy. Uh, but the second you know, thing he ran on was the issue of, you know, engagement with North Korea. And uh, he. Wait, wait, just ran- one minute, just one sec before we get there. But I mean, Obviously, it's been hurt by Corona, uh, and that's a big setback. But, I mean, he's popular. He's made some inroads because they just had, um, I don't know what they would be, uh, uh, the equivalent of like off-term elections or local elections uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And his party performed very well. I think they even exceeded expectations. It was a, it was a, a landslide victory for right. Moon Jae-in's uh, ruling party, the Democratic Party of Korea. Uh, and uh, it was it was an election. It was a congressional election, National Assembly, and and, and uh, so he he won a, a very large majority and an alliance with a, you know another uh, small you know left wing uh, party, uh, the the Democratic Party of Korea now has a pre you know veto proof majority uh, in the National Assembly, which is going to help. And one of the things yep. I've pointed out recently in, in uh, a recent article I did for the nation was, uh, before the election, the party endorsed, uh, a, a green new deal for South Korea. And, you know, that's one of its campaign platforms is to, is to end, end, uh, you know, carbon emissions. And, and South Korea has a, has a big problem with, with carbon emissions. It's, it's air is really dirty and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of polluting industries, and air also blows in from 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 China and the Gobi Desert. Uh, that, that really creates serious serious problems. Uh, when I was there, uh, in the last couple of times I've been there, the, the air has been in, in Seoul, in particular, has been has been really bad. So that that's been that's been a big issue. 
So yeah, now talk about the other aspect, which was an engagement with, with North Korea, I guess. Yeah. I mean, what he ran on and this was like a big drama a couple of years ago, uh, there were those meetings with, with Trump and I, it always struck me. I'll just say that, you know, watching Moon Jae-in manage both these individual egos <laughs> and also this just incredibly complicated situation of his own policy agenda and taking on the U S national security state and a narcissistic, you know, president who's all over the place. And then also, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, all of the, the, you know, d- dangers and problems of the North Korean government. I mean, that was, I, that was incredible to watch him kind of operate. Well, this whole process was set up, you know, during the, people may remember during the Olympic games and in, in the, the winter Olympic games in early January, 2018, two years ago, when for the first time, you know, senior leaders in North Korea crossed the DMZ and went into South Korea uh, as Moon Jae-in's guests and, uh, you know, his, his Kim Jong-un didn't go at that time, but his sister did. Uh, and other, other very high-ranking officials were there at the same time that Vice President Pence was there for the Olympics and other, other officials from the United States. And that's actually, you know, when the peace process began because uh, at that, during, the, during those times, uh, you know, Kim invited Moon uh, to, to meet and they did about two months later, and 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 had a had a summit uh, at at Panmunjom at the at the border area, and agreed on a you know, number of steps. Uh, that, and then later they met in September of 2018, and set out a whole agenda of of you know peace process through uh, economic development, mutual economic development, uh, and that out of that came the invitation relayed through Moon Jae-in to, to Trump to meet directly with Kim Jong-un. And that's how that meeting in Singapore came about in June 2018. Uh, the, the struggle has been, uh, the, you know, the U.S. has had a very hard line. You know, you, you, we're not going to, you know, there's, there's very tough sanctions imposed on North Korea and have been for, for many years. But especially after 2017, the U.N. added a whole bunch of sanctions in retaliation for their testing of, of ICBMs. And uh, so uh, those sanctions, the, the U.S. P- position has been, Trump's position has been uh, no movement in terms of uh, we're not going to we're not going to grant lift any of these sanctions until North Korea agrees completely and has shown signs that it's given up all of its nuclear weapons. And Moon Jae-in has been uh, trying to work with the U.S. in 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 trying to say that look, uh, North and South Korea working together will really help the peace process. But to do that, like do things like link their railroads and and on some of these other projects they've been talking about, like in you know having a, in, investing in uh, tourism uh, in North Korea, so South Koreans can go to North Korea and visit, and vice versa some sanctions you know have to be lifted or temporarily lifted so that those things can happen and the u.s has been unwilling to lift those kinds of sanctions and so there's been kind of a you know the the the, the talks with u.s and north korea haven't moved anywhere because of that but also the process of trying to have engagement between north and south has stopped because because of the sanctions issue and so now you know now that he has this mandate with the election, his party has a very strong mandate to, to continue this. He's trying to take some steps that would, you know, that would be able to, North and South would be able to do things like this railroad um, construction, mutual work on the, on the railroad system. He's trying to do that, you know, move forward without, uh, you know, with, without violating the sanctions, but without, you know, getting, you know, the so kind of permission from the U.S. to do that. And that's kind of where things stand with, with that. But, you know, it really has fundamentally changed the atmosphere in South Korea around the border area, the DMZ, as a result of the meetings between Kim and Moon in 2018, there was a, there was a major de-escalation along the border. You know, guard posts were taken down, mines were removed and, 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 and that kind of thing. So the, 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 the possibility of an armed confrontation there is much less than it was. And that's that's very important, and that's very reassuring to, to people in South Korea. 
what is the perception inside South Korea? Because in the United States, uh, you know, there was a lot of drum beats of, of we should be terrified of North Korea and they could, you know, they could shoot a missile against, you know, hit Hawaii or Guam or San Francisco or anything like that. And, and what I'm curious about is, and, and particularly to the best extent you could read a South Korean perspective, is really to distinguish, you know, things get very conflated, obviously, in our press coverage. And you've done a great job of distinguishing this, that as an example, of course, there's brutal human rights violations in North Korea. Of course, there's an authoritarian structure that has that, that is absolutely not a one to one to them being any type of a uh, real external threat, certainly in the United States. I mean, South Korea is different, obviously. And that third, regardless of what you think of the nature of the government, it doesn't mean that they don't have their own um, valid national security concerns and their own sense of U.S. Uh, you know, uh, presence, essentially. So what I guess, what is the actual security situation there if I was, if you were going to look at it just sort of from a, a realist perspective of the North Koreans? And then in South Korea, where there is actually the threat, I mean, you know, if, if something went off, we wouldn't pay the consequence in the United States. South Korea and obviously North Koreans would. It seems like this agenda he has of engagement and diplomacy is pretty popular, at least at the moment. Well, you know, his popularity right now is about 70% in, right. the, in the recent polls. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, COVID-19 and how the government has handled that. But, but, but people also support by a majority, there's been, you know, polls taken on specifically on his North Korea policies. And, you know, about 60%, you know, support this engagement. And, you know, people there are, you know, they're, they're, they're used to, you know, confrontational atmosphere with North Korea. It's been happening for years and years. Uh, that, you know, when I was living there in 2017, at the height of, uh, you know, the sort of missile scare when North, when the DPRK was testing these ICBMs and tensions really rose with the U.S., people and people where I was in Kwangju were far more worried about, you know, Trump doing something stupid and launching a unilateral attack or something like that. They, they were, you know, they, they weren't concerned that North Korea was going to invade or attack them. And also, a lot of people there understand that, you know, for one thing, the, you know, South Korea's military is about seven times bigger than North Korea's. Uh, and, you know, they spend about seven times more than North Korea does on, on military. So they have, a, they have a huge military force in South Korea. I wrote a piece for The Nation a few months ago, you know, talking about this large military buildup by the South Korean military, as well as the U.S. and Japan. And so, the North Korea sees itself surrounded, you know, by a very vast military power jointly run by the U.S. in alliance with South Korea and Japan. And, you know, the U U.S. forces in Asia Pacific include, you know, aircraft carriers that carry nuclear weapons, uh, you know, planes that carry nuclear weapons based in Guam and, and, and you know, so on. So, you know, the North Koreans and, you know, a lot of, I think even a lot, you know, a lot of hardline analysts here in the United States understand that they built their nuclear weapons capability to protect themselves from another uh, attack from the United States. And they looked at, you know, what happened in Iraq, the U.S. invaded Iraq, the U.S. Uh, NATO uh, overthrew a government in, in Libya that, that had already, you know, denuclearized. Uh, and they said, well, you know, we're not going to be invaded like that and taken over. Uh, so I think, you know, the, the U.S., I keep saying this over and over again, the United States is not a neutral player, you know, it's not an innocent bystander in Korea. During the Korean War, U.S. Air Force completely destroyed North Korea with bombing, firebombing, napalm. Three million more or more civilians, civilians were killed. It was an unbelievable, terrible, terrible war. And people in North Korea, of course, never forget that. People in South Korea don't forget that. And nobody wants a war. And I think, you know, one of the issues that happened with, with Moon Jae-in, a kind of a turning point in the peace process there was in, in, uh, in 2017, around August 2017 or so, there was, you know, a lot of thinking going on here in Washington of a unilateral, U.S. unilateral attack on North Korea. And, you know, Moon Jae-in made it very clear that 
there cannot be any kind of unilateral attack like that because any kind of war would, of course, envelop South Korea and you could have millions killed within hours. You have all this, you know, artillery, North Korean artillery just north of Seoul. And, you know, it would just be, it would be a terrible thing. And so, you know, he, he, you know, made some very public statements and, you know, made sure that that did not happen. And that was a big reason that Trump actually began uh, talking with the North. So it's, you know, it's still a difficult situation, but I think that, uh, I think Moon has the right idea that you engage and slowly, you know, move toward, you know, you know, peacemaking steps, take steps, gradual steps toward a peace. Denuclearization should be the final step in the peace process. You build trust, you know, and then, and then you, 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 through these projects, you build more trust. And then over time, uh, then you can de-escalate the military situation. It, you know, it, it's a process. Right. And you know, the, it, it, the, you know, people in the United States have to recognize that, yes, you may hate their government, the North Korean government, you may despise their dictator, but they have a right to exist. <laughs> you know, there's people there, there's 30 million people in North Korea who, who you know, have the same kind of, you know, wants and needs that, you know, most human beings have. And one of them is, you know, not to have a war and not to be destroyed in a war. And so, you know, I think uh, there's a real tendency in, 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 in America, especially even, you know, many liberals. Oh, yeah. Uh, they were freaking Trump out about Trump talking to him. And it was, yeah. I, I couldn't believe the pretzels that, I mean, the idea that, you know, yeah, let them engage with each other. If, you know, if Washington Trump- to talk to you. I mean- He's I, their leader, I, right? Bizarre. Bizarre. I, I don't and and this idea that you're rewarding him. I mean, I don't know what the what the alternative. Is. I, I I I was I was flummoxed by that. But you know, maybe I'm simple minded. <laughs> I could. Well, no, it's it's, yeah, I, I, it's, a valid, it's a valid concern because you know, yeah. I mean, you know, as I you know, I and others point out a lot. You know, I mean, you know, the U.S. after all was allied with SSR under Stalin. Uh, you know. Franklin Roosevelt, you know, met with met with Stalin, and and you know we were allies at that time. I mean, you know, and and you know Stalin was was a you know was almost the definition of a dictator, right? So you know, but he was a leader of the Soviet Union at the time, and so you know that's you have to do business. Who? What is uh in the in the last couple of minutes? What? How is uh? What is the relationship between uh, Moon Jae-in and China? And how does uh, the China dimension play in all this? Well, actually, uh, they actually have pretty good relations uh, with with China. And I think, I think actually, you know, the other day, uh, you know, Xi Jinping and and, and Moon agreed. You know, that he, he, Xi said he's going to visit, wants to visit South Korea sometime this year. Uh, they've had they've had a lot of meetings, and a lot of, a lot of discussions. I mean, there's a huge amount of trade between you know South Korea and China. And, you know, they've been economic uh, partners, you know, for, 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 for many, many years. Uh, and so, and so, you know, uh, I mean, re relations can be pretty tense. They, they got, they got, they got pretty tense, uh, you know, when uh, South Korea allowed or, you know, gave permission to the U.S. to build these uh, THAAD anti-missile batteries that were very unpopular in South Korea, but that because of the radar in those, in those THAAD, system uh many many people in, in the government of china thought that was also directed at them uh it was it was not only you know aimed at you know stopping north korean missiles but it was it was a kind of escalation with tensions with with china and so uh they you know chinese uh boycotted south korean products and so on um but that's that's kind of ebb but you know you know because of china's close relationship with north korea uh, you know, they've been allies for a long time. There are no, of course, there's no Chinese troops or anything like that in, in, in the North, uh, like there are U.S. troops in the South. But, you know, so South Korea, you know, wants, you know, has to maintain those, those kinds of relationships. And I think there's a lot of movement in Asia and East and Northeast Asia toward, you know, more integration of, of uh, economies. And, and, you know, there's a lot of plans on the, on the drawing boards in China and South Korea as well 
you know, for all kinds of projects uh, to, to, you know, in, more integrate those, those countries. So it's in their interest to, you know, that's a, that's, that's a, a very big uh, push, but that's one of the reasons for, uh, you know, Moon, you know, having maintaining good relationships with the Chinese leadership. Tim Shorek, really appreciate your time as always. Everybody read Tim, uh, his reporting in The Nation. It's, it's, a, it's a, I mean, it's nice to have uh, a leader and a government to be impressed with right now. And it's also uh, very, very important that you, you read beyond the cliches uh, when you're reading about Korea. So, Tim, thanks so much for all the work you do. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. All right, folks. Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess. Uh, oh, we're not taking breaks anymore. We're 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 powering Bye-bye. forward. See you, Tim. See you, Bye-bye. Tim. Thanks so much. Um, I have to. Video's have worked to, out. Video worked out. Yep. Um, I am. I always feel weird saying this. It's, I know it's it's not Corona, but I am not feeling great. So we'll see how much I can kind of power through the fun half. Um. Let's, uh, as always, become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. That's how this show happens. Subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. If you haven't yet, check out justcoffee.coop. Fair trade tea, coffee, or chocolate. Go to the Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. Check out the content. Then if you have the ability, go become a patron at patreon.com slash tmbs. A lot of history oriented and also uh fun stuff in the post games and just great interviews adolph reed jr cornell west president lula whole lot of things actually our uh our interview we did with president lula is now being uh, uh featured by the new uh progressive international project which is uh fun go get a copy of against the web cosmopolitan answer to the new right and uh much appreciated, everybody. Um, Jamie, what's cooking? Oh, well, this week on the Antifada, we have a hot, fresh episode of History as a Weapon, the amazing series that Sean does with the great Matt Crispin of Chapo Trap House that came out on Monday. They talk about our current crisis in all of its gory glory i guess and uh they get kind of black pilled but like kind of hopeful again towards the end uh check it out um if you don't have any money uh write to us and we will hook you up because we are a communist podcast and we would be probably hypocrites if we didn't do that um also on wednesday we released um, a panel that Andy and I moderated with three very smart people as part of Red May Seattle on uh, coronavirus and the future of work, featuring Aaron Bananov, Annie McClanahan, and Magali Miranda. And then tomorrow, we are releasing a crossover episode that Sean did with Terrence from the Trillbilly Workers Party on Arigi and World Systems Theory. So uh, check all those things out. Patreon.com slash the Antifada. I like world systems theory. I'm a world systems theory guy. Hell uh, yeah. Matt. Uh, a literary hangover. You know, Michael mentioned our interview with Cornell West. And in that interview, he dropped a name of Richard Slotkin. And uh, I will be Ooh. talking about uh, Richard Slotkin's The Fatal Environment, The nice. Myth of the Frontier in the Age of Industrialization, 1800 1890. While, really playing, good. while playing Red Dead Redemption 2 tonight, uh, uh, I might Twitch have to check in. Flash Literary <laughs> Hangover. So it's going to be a good one, folks. Uh, check that out. I'll use Twitch for the first time, buddy. <laughs> that sounds great. All right, folks. Um, we're going to go to the fun half, and we will see you there. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to 
smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. (laughs) What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. I think I might be a Nazi. Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way. Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> uh, 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 ooh. Wow. Uh, 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 um, Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Ooh. Let's let's. I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me, hey, 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 shut up. Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Oh, let me unmute you guys. Sorry. There you go. Unmuted. Oh, welcome to the fun half. Michael Brooks here along with the crew. Um, let's go straight to some sound. Remember when Donald Trump, it was actually the funniest moment to me since uh, the outbreak of the pandemic uh, where Donald Trump said, I want to get right underneath the model. And I'm not involved with the models, at least not this kind of a model and you're just like all right crown king <laughs> funniest thing like i i think i was in tears and i rewatched that about 10 times especially because when he said this he wasn't even in front of the podium so you really got like a great shot of his gut and his hat and like his trademark too long tie and just watching him be like i'm gonna go right underneath Underneath the model, but I'm not involved with the models, at least not this kind of a model. And he said it as if, like, I know you're going to say that I'm lying because obviously I'm involved with models. So let me just do it for you. There was that moment. It is impossible for SNL to do a good parody of Trump. Nobody oh, is funnier yeah. than him. He's infinitely funnier than that's what I, Oh, yeah. He, Donald Trump's drinking antifreeze. Ha, 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 ha. SNL is ha, ha. so fangless lately. It's all just Baldwin. Which one is it? Alex or Alec Baldwin? Alec. Say? Doesn't Alec. matter. The lesser. But- the greater He's born Baldwin. With a silver spoon in your mouth. Like you're a Baldwin. Wasn't isn't he come from a No, I don't think so, actually. They just oh, happen really? to have a bunch of siblings who Oh well, fair enough. I'm sorry, yeah. Alec Baldwin. I'm sure there's no nepotism on the SNL staff at all. But. He still oh, sucks no. though. Nepotism is yeah, totally far, far into SNL. Uh but I mean I, I shouldn't have so that's the sort of bizarrely comedic way of getting into this. But the point is, is that Donald Trump in the last several weeks, now we've seen multiple suppressed CDC reports. I have no doubt that the calculation inside the white house is that, you know, people who are dying aren't our voters. Uh, let's get back going. 
And so now in addition to aggressively trying to suppress the actual numbers, Donald Trump is moving the goalposts here. It used to be, you know, we'll be under 30, we'll be under 50. We want to get right underneath the model. Well, here he is in a pandemic that he allowed. He, I mean, he has made the wrong decision. He has made the death decision every single step of the way. And now this bloated fuck is on TV saying that 100,000 people dying, and we know it's going to be a lot more, and we know that he doesn't want an accurate counting of it. Yeah, you know, that, that's solid work for a pandemic that we allowed to spread. We're going to lose over 100,000, perhaps, in this country. Now, in all fairness, that's at the bottom level of the scale. We would have lost 2 million. We would have lost more if we did it a different way. But you're talking about 100,000 more, a little bit less, more? Who knows? It's a terrible thing. No. So that can't be replaced. Uh, We're spending trillions of dollars on all of the damage economically, financially that it's caused. So it, it is a terrible thing. It's just an incredible thing. We were sailing. Two months ago, we were sailing. We were well, going. Incredible. We had the best of it everything. It was the best unemployment situation in my yeah. lifetime, best. certainly. And now. Well, you weren't sailing. I mean, you know. Who's that bootlicker interviewer? Maria Bartiromo. Maria Bartiromo. Maria Bartiromo. Yeah. Maria Bartiromo. Oh, Bartiromo. Right uh, no, but I think, again, I mean, I want to actually put some, you know, you have to question the resiliency and power of an economy that is built on, you know, uh, temp jobs and non-protected jobs that can be shed in the tens of millions. And those trillions that he's talking about have been a bipartisan project to prop up the financial industry uh, and other corporate interests with absolutely nothing substantive or systemic for workers. And, uh, you know, across the board, it's, it's disgusting. And he is, you know, he is readjusting the goalposts there while fighting against measuring the actual numbers themselves. This is, uh, let's play a final Trump. Um, actually, I guess we have two more Trump clips. This is, this is on a similar lane. Look, I think Fau- Fauci is just an example of somebody who's trying to do their job. I mean, this is his job. I don't, I mean, he, the, the, I I appreciate the work he's doing and it's great. And obviously he needs to be protected from the psychopaths that are trying to destroy him, but he's also so valorized because we have, you know, completely gutted. We don't even have a reference point for just sort of like basic gut public good provision governance. So a guy who's affiliated with the federal government saying, yeah, let's not, um, do a real-time immune system experiment with the millions of students, Senator Paul. Um, maybe instead of that, we should just hang out for another couple of months, save some lives. This stuff stands out. Um, and, and frankly, at this point, his courage does stand out because he's under fire um, from so many obscene people. Here's Donald Trump. Uh, directly going against him saying that that answer about reopening the schools about not putting children across the country's health in jeopardy yeah it's unacceptable dr fauci is playing both sides are you suggesting that the advice well, is i was, surprised, is, is I was surprised by his answer actually uh because uh you know uh it's just to me it's not an acceptable answer especially when it comes to schools. The only thing that would be acceptable, as I said, is professors, teachers, etc., over a certain age. I think they ought to take it easy for another few weeks, five weeks, four weeks, who knows, whatever it may be. But I think they have to be careful because this is a disease that attacks age and it attacks health. And if you have a heart problem, if you have diabetes, if you're a certain age, uh, it's certainly uh, much more dangerous but with the young children, I mean, uh, and students, it's really, it's uh, just take a look at the statistics. It's pretty amazing. Mr. President, businesses are concerned. So, I mean, of course we know, I mean, first of all, as we always, always, always point out, 
those students will very likely have interaction with people in the higher risk groups at one time or another. You don't, you can't just sort of magically wall off major sections of society. And then the other thing is, is that we don't know. I mean, we, we know very basic, obvious things, right? We do, of course, if you, we know that there are preconditions that in general uh, would make you more susceptible basically to everything. So I don't even, I don't even know how clarifying that particular bit of information is at this point, frankly, in general, if you're older, if you have a condition like diabetes, you are at more risk for many things, including in fact, a common flu, which all these assholes were saying it was a couple of months ago when things were just sailing. Uh, So we've, I've seen reports in New York, as I always say, I'm very reticent to, you know, get into the details with this without specifically talking to somebody in epidemiology or medicine, but there's reporting around some school kids in New York getting uh, uh, sick in ways that I think they are linking to the virus that are horrifying and deeply disturbing. There's definitely people in, you know, twenties and thirties uh, and forties who are in, you know, don't have uh, pre-existing conditions who have died from this. And by the way, this is a hard, like even the people that you have known or I have known, I should say, who recovered described like the worst physical experience they've ever had in their lives for a couple of weeks. And you want to deploy that potentially in a, let's say really conservative, let's say a couple hundred thousand students nationally, kids get this for absolutely no reason because we're rushing open because Republicans all of a sudden care about public education. Uh, Why? And and that's a burden on the healthcare system as well. I mean, pediatricians across the country dealing with an outbreak of kids who cannot breathe, having asthma plus symptoms and everything else, and then going into already overcrowded hospitals and maybe making it more dangerous for, as an example, somebody who doesn't have Corona, but has symptoms related to diabetes. I mean, one of the horrible things that happened in New York, I'm sure it happened elsewhere, but I could tell you stories that I know of, you know, personally that are nightmares of people in those risk categories that needed to go get medical attention because of something that they were dealing with. And then basically, I mean, by all, everything you could tell, you know, contracting the virus at the hospital. So, I I mean, whatever, it's obscene. We just need to chronicle this stuff. You know, there's, there isn't really that much analysis to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's basically I mean, where it's a, a journalistic obligation to just catalog it, um, but yeah. And also well, to just the, he has the one speed of making this a political issue. Like imagine going to a doctor and they're like, "Well, it looks like you have cancer," and you're just like, "That's an unacceptable answer, it's unacceptable. doctor." <laughs> okay. Not even like I'm going to get a second opinion. I'm like, "That's unacceptable." Yeah. And to do what something about this? What Fauci said was to Rand Paul like. We shouldn't be cavalier with child children's health right. because we don't know enough yet. It's like yes. we can be cavalier. What do you yeah. call them, the Cleveland Cavaliers? If you can't yeah. be cavalier, for I was very surprised that he said that we couldn't be cavalier with children's health. Yeah, I think there is some analysis to this because most people can understand on a very visceral and intuitive level that it is the wrong call to make decisions uh, that will kill people just to prop up this imaginary, uh, this, this abstract yet very real thing that controls all of us called the economy. They can't shut down for a month. What the hell is going on? And hopefully this will cause some people to question the underlying assumptions of this system and the wisdom of having such a thing where if people stop going to work for a month, the entire world collapses. Yeah. Oh, we've definitely talked about that a lot. And that's, that's, that's definitely true. And I think, you know, the, the distinction to be made um, with regards to this particular Republican variant is there, there's the big picture. And Thomas Friedman started this several weeks ago with the upmarket version of like, Hey, maybe we can get back to work. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I'm just picking randomly here. Maybe it'd be good if people could get back to Foot Locker. Um, uh, and and certainly the Democrats doing nothing systemically, even in this heroes bill that we went into yesterday, 
uh, to address people's needs. The, what Trump is pushing, and I'm sure that Trump, you know, had, he wants to juice the stock market. He has a very specific short time frame and anxiety around it. But even from, you know, purely cold macroeconomic advice, like, yes, you want some activities to resume. And by the way, you're already seeing, I mean, you know, Amazon and other places are doing great. You don't really want, you know, if, I, if I'm just looking at this purely economically, I don't think I want schools running again, driving up a budget, you know, like wasting money, causing a burden to the health system. I don't necessarily want a million businesses functioning at a loss that are just going to fold anyways. And I think this is where, of course, it's connected to material conditions. Of course, Republican governors, their primary motivation is they don't want to pay unemployment benefits. And they absolutely want to use this to, to discipline the workforce and cut the social safety net and all the rest of it. But this Republican, like, th there is like a specific death cult variant on this because pushing to open the schools very specifically does not make economic sense. Well, you know, what does it not is, make logistical they're, sense. They're in it a double not, bind. It does well, not make logistical sense. It, right. it makes coercion of labor sense, though, because yes. as soon as you open those schools again, all of a sudden those parents don't have the excuse of, I can't yeah, get, get back to work. And get those are work. those. Like right. that's the part of the economy. That's the shadow part of this opening, right. right? Like we reopen schools that because we want the parents that are like really, because those people are really crunched right now too, especially if, if you're like lower income, you like childcare, good luck finding a daycare, right? Right. And I mean, yeah, it's like, well, that's the, that's one of the reasons we have schools. I mean, it's a good, the salutary reasons is to educate the populace. But the bad reasons is to free up their parents for more labor to give to capitalists. And that's actually that's that's what this reopen the schools thing is back about to get those parents of those kids back at back at work. You have Absolutely. no excuse now. Right? I, I mean, they're kind of uh, being plagued by contradictions right now. Right. Because it has a very real toll on the economy the longer that they that people don't go back to work. On the other hand, it will also take a toll on the economy if they do not flatten the curve and the virus continues to ravage through the world. So uh, it's, it's, an it's, a, it's a difficult situation and you're going to take a hit no matter what you do, as long as we are um, subservient to the logic of the market. Um, and one more thing about the, the economic dimension of this crisis. Economists were saying for a while now that we were headed for another crash, another recession. They're mainstream economists, Republicans, right-wingers, whoever, capitalists is telling you now that this is a completely uh, a freak accident and everything would have been fine if we hadn't have gotten this um, coronavirus crisis. And that is just not true. We were headed for a recession one way or another. Um, also, unemployment doesn't give you the whole picture. We were talking about this earlier. A lot of people aren't unemployed. They're underemployed in increasingly precarious labor. So maybe think twice before you brag about the economy, dude. Talking yeah, to Trump. I, I think unemployment, the, uh... unemployment numbers are basically like, look how good we've done at like uh, forcing people to work for our capitalists. Basically, that's well, why I, mean, I think I least... mean, it's people like work, right? Like and, and people should be able to find labor that like contributes to their life and material well-being. But the unemployment rate being so fixated with that, when you look at like other countries that have much higher unemployment rates and uh, better quality of life, it's it's definitely not the BL end all. Yeah, some of these people have like three different jobs that all pay shit. That's yeah. not like, like that's not an accurate picture of the economic health of the populace. Some estimates say that you know well over half of the jobs created. Um, post 2008 recession right. are in mm -hmm. the Uber economy for sure. Certainly my experience. Absolutely. And, the and those jobs this... don't have, they don't have unions. They don't have protections. They are precarious there. And, and even, you know, I remember Bernie, I remember that really, I forget what it was, but there was this whiny, ridiculous, uh, um, uh, fact check in the Washington post because Bernie would say that, you know, millions of Americans are working more than two jobs 
uh, or two jobs to survive. And I don't remember how they, you know, they tried to like say like, well, it's actually not that many people. And it was like, I mean, I guess we're quibbling over the phrase that many basically, because yes, it is absolutely millions and millions of people uh, in that situation without a doubt. And the Um, growth of this sector is predicated on rising inequality, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of the wages are being paid by um, tips from averagely employed workers who use these services, right? Like uh, Instacart or Seamless or whatever. It's predicated on an increasing gap between the averagely employed worker and the underemployed worker. So I I think we're going to see things get even worse as the wages of the average worker fall. I saw a headline, I don't know if it's true, but that Bezos might be uh, uh, set to become the world's first trillionaire. Mm-hmm. Based yeah. on this, which is- that was in the Telegraph, but like, I mean, it's right. certainly possible. It's certainly <laughs> possible. Um, we need an international union so here for Amazon is, workers. Here is Donald Trump. Now, he's got another thing on his mind. If all of this weren't bad enough, and if this pandemic wasn't totally unfair enough to begin with, he now has to worry about an election that takes place in a safe way and allows most people to vote. And if that happens, his reelection prospects are looking very dim, which is why he needs to build a bunch of conspiracy theories and nonsense about mail-in voting. To suggest that, that I don't know. It depends. I, it's certainly not the package that I saw today. Basically, if you look at that package, what they want more than anything else is uh, it's a voting package. They want to be able to make sure that Republicans can't win an election by putting in all sorts of uh, uh, mailing ballots. Now, I don't know if you do because the press doesn't report this too much, but we had two very big victories last night. <laughs> And the thing that's the thing about this is like it's useful from a propaganda value that the president and leader of the Republican Party is saying, like, if we enfranchise people more readily, that we won't be allowed to win elections. The thing I'm worried about now, though, is that I trust uh, Nancy Pelosi more to say, like, oh, you're right, we are overreaching. We'll just do like some half ass mail in ballot, like, for. I don't know people above the age. No, or she'll or take something. his she'll take his concerns seriously and be like, "Well, we put in measures X, Y, Z, X two, X three, like in order to make sure there is no possible mail in fraud." And there's yeah. been like what, like a dozen cases of it in the past twenty years, maybe. Yeah, like this is a fight that we should have about voting in this country, but like the war we're going to battle with, to use the Iraq War metaphor or whatever, is not ready for that. <laughs> um, like, yeah, stand gonna, up for yourselves, guys. You think yeah. of all things, voting would be something that the Democrats would be comfortable defending. Yeah, but Pelosi's got the Democrats. She, the, the Democrats Pelosi likes their their vote is it's going to be in. She's they're got the Democrats get... she wants. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's, she's got, got the Democrats Democrat. exactly. That's very they'll, important. They'll send. Exactly. They'll, they already have. They have their you know absentee ballot and go back to their fridge with their you know twelve dollar pint of ice cream. There is nothing that is required to understand you know pelosi's tactics more than the fact that she likes her suburban democrats um and everything is built around that all right let's talk briefly this is an important story the senate has voted to allow the fbi to look at your browsing history without a warrant and i'll read briefly from this report and vice The U.S. Senate has voted to give law enforcement agencies access to web browsing data without a warrant, dramatically expanding the government's surveillance powers in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. The power grab was led by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell as part of a reauthorization of the Patriot Act, which gives federal agencies broad domestic surveillance powers. Senators Ron Wyden, Democrat of Oregon, and Steve Daines, Republican of Montana, attempted to remove the expanded powers from the bill with a bipartisan amendment, but in a shocking upset, the privacy preserving amendment fell short by one vote after several senators who would have voted yes, failed to show up to the session, including Bernie Sanders and nine democratic senators voted no, causing the amendment to fall short of the 
60 vote threshold. And I'll just say this one. Mm. I don't know why Bernie didn't show up. Obviously I think that, you know, I'm sure in his case, there's a good reason. Uh, You know, I do. I, I both give Bernie more deference as a politician. And this is also why he is in some, sometimes going to be held to a whole higher standard. And this is absolutely disgraceful and disastrous that this wasn't taken care of and he wasn't there. And this, by the way, is also different. It's different from people who were trying to hold him for a different standard on the CARES Act, which of course was an absolute disaster. Um, But the truth was, was that this was going to get passed. This was going to get muscled through. And the only thing that he could really do was try to insert in some decent provisions, which he did on temp workers and on unemployment uh, benefits. Which people have been freaking out about since. Like right. I've seen these stories about people getting too much because of burning. I mean, it's absolutely. Actually, yeah. No. And that's ridiculous. So, you know, on something where he's either going to be held to a completely different standard, uh, I'll, I'll push back. And then obviously, uh, you know, note all that he has done that is positive. This is totally unacceptable. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to get lost in a conversation about a particular political personality, but this in terms of something that is so threatening and so dangerous overall but it's a disaster that he did not vote against this amendment. He says Trump is the most dangerous president all the time. He didn't vote to make sure that, you know, Bill Barr's and, you know, and and Donald Trump don't have this capacity at the same time. Let's also, you know, uh, the extraordinary irresponsible F up of, of the Sanders office to not vote on this. Well, let's also remind ourselves of Bob Casey, Democrat of Pennsylvania, uh, Carper, Democrat, uh, Tom Carper, Democrat of Delaware, Dianne Feinstein, Democrat of California, Ooh. Maggie Hassan, Democrat of, I believe, of New Hampshire, Tim Kaine in the membrane, everybody, uh, of uh, Virginia, the inspiring selection of, of uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's vice president, Joe Manchin, Gene Shaheen, Ooh. Mark Warner, Ooh. Sheldon Whitehouse, and Doug Jones. So this is an obscene uh, extraordinarily dangerous vote um, and serious marks against all of those Democrats. And of course, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell doing his job as the grave digger of democracy and the Trump administration. I mean, again, this is where the rubber meets the road. And this is the, the extension of the national security state, uh, honestly, going really back to Reagan when he reversed some small reforms that Carter had tried to to do uh, in light of uh, the church commission, all of that, but Bush, Obama, and Trump has been consolidation and expansion. And particularly for people who, you know, recognize and in some areas, I think accurately, some of the unique dangers and pathologies of the Trump administration, this is just absolutely unacceptable, profoundly dangerous. And uh, I mean, honestly, just don't think we're gonna have to keep track of. Yeah, so much for limited government, right? Yeah, yeah like. Oh, oh God, watch. Oh, Jesus Christ. All right, fine, yeah, go. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There were 10 things you need to do. Number one. You register to vote and it's on. You post that Hillary sign up on your lawn. Number two. Call some undecideds with your crew. Your cousins in Ohio maybe try and flip them blue. Number three. Watch Hillary examine the terrain. Why are you doing this to me? Tim Kaine in the membrane. Tim Kaine in the brain. <laughs> so this Tim is, ba- if we play this enough, Donald Trump can win re-election even with a 30% unemployment rate. Oh my God. Oh my God. God these fucking morons. Can you imagine that these are the same people that have conniptions about, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, DSA people that don't want to campaign for Biden. This is it. Look at, look at your Lena Dunham video. Look to the extent pop culture products influence any of this stuff, which it's greatly overstated in general. Uh, there you go. That, that is, I mean, that is like violently embarrassing. I don't, I don't I think, even know how to process I think that. It's cringe. I think more than Hillary dabbing or the hot sauce thing, that's the thing you can play and just watch the chats just go crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're trying to make me blind with rage when we only have two days left in the week. That's Project Mockingbird, basically, right, Matt? Like, 
<laughs> Hamilton obsession. Like it, it has to oh, be yeah. CIA. Like it's, it, well, it's, yeah, it's, 2016 was insane, man. I feel like I need to just go back in time and like you can link. It. I mean, look, I I don't think he's like literally like a plant. Well, no. But I think you can connect Lin Manuel to the State Department by just saying his father. So yeah. that's all I'll say about that. Occam's Razor. Yeah. If he's I mean, not he's, a he's cop, of that he's of that milieu. Let's he's just definitely say. doing cop work. Yeah. All right, guys. I think I can only do one more uh, kind of segment. I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm just not feeling good. Um, okay. Uh, Let's do uh, clip number six. This is not going to be included, is not concluded so far uh, in the Pelosi package. This is Premila Jaipal explaining her proposal to expand uh, the hero stimulus to Chris Hayes. Businesses be able to pay their rent and mortgage. I do not think that this bill contains that. I think it has amazing, excellent things in it. But at the end of the day, can we go back and say that we are protecting paychecks, that we are the party of keeping workers in their jobs, that we are making sure that everyone is covered with health care, and that we are providing businesses with relief so that they can stay open, that, that economy that is so important to us. And that's why I've proposed... Uh, a couple of, a couple of bills and my colleagues have proposed a couple of bills my paycheck guarantee would ensure that we get money directly to workers and that it continues not a one time stimulus payment not pushing people onto unemployment insurance but keeping them tied to their jobs and recovering paychecks two a medicare crisis bill that would say that we would expand health care to actually include people that are unemployed on medicare and people that are uninsured on medicaid and that we don't allow anybody to lose their health care in the midst of a health care crisis. And that the third bill that I think we should be including, it's, it's, I'm a co-sponsor, but it's actually Donna Shalala and Jamie Raskin and others who have said we need a real plan to reopen America. Tie states to ensuring that they're following CDC guidelines so that we do not have uh, meat packers that suddenly are going to work before it's safe that we are sure that workers in every industry are not being pushed back to work without following public health guidance because we can't afford to have more people die. And to me, if we combine those three things with the state and local government money, um, that would allow us to provide states and, uh, and businesses and workers with certainty and with scale. Because I don't want to go back and in and after passing this bill, go back in May and watch the unemployment numbers go up, watch the number of deaths go up and say that we didn't do anything to address that. I'll tell you, I, if I feel, Chris, like I'm on the Titanic and it's sinking and we've got a three and a half trillion dollar bucket, but it's got lots of holes in it and we're trying to save. That can't be the answer um, and, you know, there's a lot of hard work that's gone into this bill. I'm not trying to throw shade on it. it you know, we are doing so much more than know. Republicans are. But we, we have a chance to show leadership and to actually show that Democrats have an answer. And it relies on those three things, providing health care, you know, making sure workers have paychecks, making sure businesses can stay. That's the that's the essence of who we are as a Democratic Party. And I unfortunately right. just don't think that that's what we're doing. Uh, popular, all makes sense, would help a lot of people maybe see off a deepening of the depression. What's the response from the Democratic leadership? Yep. Here's Jim Clyburn talking to Chuck, talk, Chuck Todd, Todd Chuck. Final question I have for you is on, on what we're seeing with uh, – the big bill that you guys introduced yesterday, and on one hand, you're getting hammered on the right. It's a liberal wish list. But you also have some progressives upset. For instance, that. you didn't include um, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal's idea of, of trying to uh, have all payrolls or try to cover almost some payrolls for some businesses. So what do you say to the left that feels as if, well, if you're, if you're doing a laundry list bill, let them have some more on it, too, since this is going to be a long, drawn-out negotiation anyway. Well, uh, I like our bill myself. Uh, you know, paycheck guarantee is great. And I think doing it this way is an efficient way to do it. In fact, I think it's the most efficient way to do it. Uh, but uh, we have to pay for all of these things. And when you pass a bill 
uh, trying to take care of state and local governments. That's primary with us. Time to take, trying to take care of those people that we named the bill after, the heroes, those essential workers, the people I just talked about. When you're trying to make sure that they're taken care of, then you look at the other things. And we just got to the point where the bill just got too big. Now, there are things in this bill that will lay a foundation for us getting to what mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Jarrell Paul uh, and others will want to get to. And I'll include myself in that as well. Yeah, okay. So, you know, Cross whatever. my heart and hope to die. And right? they love to triangulate, but it's very important that the Neil version, which is far less comprehensive and still involves financial institution mediation, is about 300 billion. Jai Paul, which would cover people's paychecks, which would also have a good effect on the economy, obviously, 650 billion as part of a $3 trillion bill. So it's utter nonsense. Guys, I, I got to wrap up. I'm really sorry. So I'm um, just not feeling great. Uh, everybody will be back uh, tomorrow. Stay safe. Stay healthy, everybody. Thanks, guys. Take care. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth 